the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks, it was this this idea of telling the life after her life um, and what that all entailed, which was the life of her family and the life of the cells. And it's it's so so much broader, but it is all encompassed by the one thing that holds them all together is that it's all connected to her. I spent ten years of my life on this, and I I felt it was I felt like it was such an important story for to tell. History was vanishing as I was working. You know, people would die soon after I interviewed. You know, some of Henrietta's really, you know, her generation was in their 90s when I started, and so was her doctor. And I felt like I was sort of scrambling. Deborah, Henrietta's daughter, is hilarious. We had so much fun together. You know, she never really knew what happened to her mother. No one really talked about it. She knew something killed her when she was 30. Deborah and her brother Zakaria were the ones who came into the lab for the first time to see the cells. Zakaria was a few months old when his mother when their mother died. Deborah was two, so they have no memory of her at all. And both of them spent most of their lives really wanting to know her and missing, you know, her. So for them, going into the lab and looking into the microscope and seeing these living cells was the closest thing they'd ever come to seeing their mother alive that they could remember. And you know, Deborah would talk to them. Um, the cells were very much their mother. Watching that drove home on a very uh, emotional level that they saw cells very differently from the way I saw cells. And there were moments while we were in there where she, you know, she was sort of giddy, excited like a little girl, and then she would get very quiet and very sort of sad. But no, more than anything, she was just so excited. It was like, I get to meet my mother. <laughs> the first time she saw one of these really great pictures of She's like, wow, she's so beautiful. And now look at her, she's beautiful when she's just cells. It was great for her to be able to see all the different ways that HeLa looks under microscopes. When I look at them, it, it's very different from looking at, at, at just some cells. I mean, to me, it's, I, it's like looking at a picture of her and Deborah and the family. To me, it's this sort of collage of all of those things that I see when I stare into it. And I just think they're the most beautiful things in the world. But the ethical issue that everybody focused on forever was that can you take someone tissues from someone without their permission and use them in research and should they have done that in the 50s and that's sort of a non-question you know you can't apply today's ethical standards to then but this other stuff really <laughs> was much was much more uh, complicated and nuanced in the 70s the family learned about the cells because some scientists in order to to understand the cells more went to the family to do research on them this is you know the early days of gene mapping so her husband had a third grade education. He didn't even know what a cell was. And the way he understood the phone call was, we've got your wife. She's alive in a laboratory. We've been doing research on her for the last 25 years. And now we have to test your kids to see if they have cancer, which wasn't what the scientists said at all. You know, she actually said she wanted to test them for HLA markers that she could use, to, you know, <laughs> things that he couldn't, couldn't possibly conceive of. And that communication sort of misfire that happened in that moment started this long saga for the family. So the scientists would come, take samples from the family, and then sort of go away and do research. They didn't try to get informed consent from the family for doing this. And I talked to the scientists who did it, and they, you know, they said, of course not. Like, but we, we just wanted some blood. <laughs> Why would we have? Um, but this happened at a point where there were actually... Um, codes, you know, ethical codes that said that they should have, but yet the laws, laws were literally happening just a few months later, a law passed saying that they, you know, that would have required informed consent. So it was this very big turning point in the way people thought of research on human subjects. They would ask questions when the scientists would show up and, you know, what does it mean that her cells are still alive and does it hurt her when you, you know, inject them with chemicals and shoot them up into space and and I came along in the 90s, still no one had told them what a cell was. You know, no one had sort of sat them down and really talked about what does it mean if that her cells are still alive. And so, you know, we did that, and, and there were many scientists who were happy to help me with that. There are people behind every single cell in a lab, and we don't often think about that. Um, you know, you, when, as a scientist, you know, you just sort of, you come through, you know, school and these biological materials that we use are just sort of omnipresent and they're just, you know, the things you order online and they come to your lab and, and people often don't kind of go that next step to sort of ask the question, who did this come from and, you know, what was their story?